Uh, welcome everyone to my keynote on three challenges in building industrial scale recommender systems. Um, uh, before we start, I would first like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me for this keynote. It's a huge honor for me. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam with a focus on data management for machine learning. So basically for the problems that occur at the intersection of data management and machine learning. Um, I'm also a research fellow at Outlet Hese, a large retailer uh, based in the Netherlands, where we have an industry collaboration on um, uh, AI problems that occur in retail. Um, other than that, I'm also the founder of the workshop on data management for end-to-end -end machine learning, DEEM, at ACM Sigma that I've been running for the last years. And previously, I've been at New York University and at Amazon Research. Um, in the beginning of my, of my um, scientific career, I worked on uh, recommender systems much more. I've uh, built a recommender system at Zalando and at Plista. I interned with the recommender systems team at Twitter, and um, I implemented some of the algorithms in Apache Mahout. And basically, in the, in, in, in the last month, I'm starting to um, get back to recommender systems. And I've been very happy about this keynote invitation that gives me the opportunity to um, share my thoughts with you. Um, so my talk is basically divided into two parts. I'm first going to talk about the challenges that we face when we bring machine learning into production. And I will try to convince you that this is actually a research problem. Um, and that basically gives an overview over the research area that I've been working on in the last years. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to focus on uh, online recommender systems. And I'm going to discuss three challenges that I see there if we want to build online recommender systems that are um, deployable in the industry. And I'm going to give you some of my thoughts there and some of the directions that uh, we are working here in our group. But first, let's start with the general challenges. Um, so in the last years, we've all seen, if we followed the news, we've seen an astonishing prog uh, progress in machine learning. Uh, we've seen that machines now manage to beat us humans in more and more games like Go or Jeopardy that we thought to be our domain. Um, we have seen uh, huge advances in computer vision. And computer vision is now being deployed in the real world. So in some airports, you can board your plane via facial recognition. Um, and there are many expectations for aut autonomous or semi-autonomous driving that is also based on these advances in computer vision. And in general, what we see is that more and more decisions are being automated with machines and with machine learning techniques. Um, and what you can also observe is that often there's kind of a gold rush mentality and also machine learning arms race in industry. So all the big cloud vendors have now machine learning services in their, in, <clears throat> in their platform. Um, there's a huge battle in hiring machine learning talent. Um, so there's a lot of technological uh, progress happening here. Um, <clears throat> but there is also another side. And um, if we look beyond the hype, then we see that this um, a rapid progress in machine learning is also accompanied by a set of serious technical and societal problems. Um, so in my opinion, the most, <clears throat> the most crucial technical problem is that if we talk to, uh, to people, to data scientists who actually do this, this work in the real world, then um, surveys always find that data preparation and data wrangling accounts for 80% of the work that these people have to do. So it's really crucial. We, tain, we train these people in statistics and machine learning, and then most of their time, basically four, four out of five days per week, they, <clears throat> they have to prepare and clean data. So that's, um, that's a waste of energy and a waste of resources. Um, and for me, that's also a wake-up call for the systems and data management community, which means we simply need to build better and smarter systems. Um, <clears throat> there's other issues. So um, some famous venture capitalists are starting to challenge the economics of, of AI and in general um, many of the new techniques like, uh, like uh, deep learning models uh, provide astonishing results but are very difficult and very expensive to put into production. And then there's another route. Um, what we also observe in the last years is that 
um, we start to automate decision making with machines and machine learning. And what happens is that in many cases, we reproduce and amplify the uh, biases and discrimination that already exists in the world. And there's many, many examples for this. Uh, a very prominent example is uh, that facial recognition um, doesn't work well for people with darker skin, for example. And the question is now, and that's also at the core of my research, um, what can we do to um, uh, tackle these problems? And I think what helps is to take a look into the past, a look into um, another period in time where there was a huge technological shift that um, also changed the world as a whole and also had uh, implications on how society changed, the Industrial Revolution. So it's really interesting that, for example, um, it took 50 years for electricity and electrical motors to revolutionize manufacturing. So the, the technology was invented, the research was there, but it still took 50 years until it had a real world impact in manufacturing. What needed to happen there was um, technology needed to be adapted. You needed to kind of reinvent how factories work so that they can benefit from electricity and you needed to reorganize the production process. Um, and in this period, these new technologies also were very dangerous. Um, they were really dangerous to the lives of people, especially to workers who worked in these factories. And um, it required a combination of technological efforts to make the technology more safe and also legis legislative error, uh, efforts to basically um, force factory owners to, um, to provide more safe working environments to mitigate these issues. And I think that we are at a similar point with machine learning. So we have all these great results in research and we have a lot of problems once we decide, uh, once we try to put these, uh, to put these uh, technologies into production. And an interesting observation is shown in this figure here that's from a famous paper that Google wrote a few years ago where they talk about the hidden technical debt in machine learning systems. And they basically say that the actual machine learning code, the training of your model, is only a, a very small part, that tiny black box there, inside a, a much bigger system and a much bigger pipeline. And there are all these orthogonal problems that have to be solved. And many of them are related to the data and the systems and the operation of them. Um, so I think we need to adapt this technology from ML research into production settings. And we need to take inspiration from data management research, research basically relational databases and related technologies um, have been in production for, for decades already. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from that. Um, and also from established practices in software engineering. So professional software engineering is very good in testing and integrating um, uh, their technologies. So I think, and that's also at the core of my research, we need to reinvent how we validate data, how we unit test, not only conventional software, but uh, machine learning applications, how we monitor these systems so that we can detect when something is going wrong. And that's especially, the monitoring is especially difficult for machine learning systems because they can basically have silent failures. So it can be that your system doesn't crash, but it simply doesn't give the right answers. And in general, I think we need to look at real end-to-end -end applications. And then for looking at fairness and accountability, I think the most important uh, insight there is that that's not only a, tech a technical problem. It's a socio-technical problem. It's not a problem that computer scientists can, uh, uh, can solve on their own. I think that we really need to work hand-in-hand -hand with experts from uh, other domains such as law experts and social scientists. And I'd like to give you a bit more details what I mean when I talk about the difference between research uh, and production. Um, and so on this slide, I try to list what I think uh, is the mental model that, uh, that we have once when we do research in a lab and what's the mental model that we face once we go into um, production deployments. So I think in the lab, we, uh, when, we, when we think about machine learning, machine learning applications, we always have this mental model of working in a Jupyter notebook. So um, we are in control of the model, we are in control of the training process, we can look at the data. Um, the data is usually static. Often we work with um, 
uh, one of many famous benchmark data sets. It's relatively clean and it's relatively well understood. Um, and also it fits into memory. So we can, for example, load it into pandas, pandas look at it, uh, <clears throat> plot all kinds of things. Um, and also importantly, often um, when we do academic work, we assume that the person on the other side who um, judges the results of our work or who uses the, the frameworks or the models that we produce also has a PhD in ML. So basically experts build software or solutions for other experts. And um, I think in, in many cases, as soon as you, as you go to, to, to industry, to real world deployments, you see that many of these assumptions simply don't hold and um, um, the world is much more complicated, unfortunately. Um, so for example, um, the data with which you have to work in real world deployments is usually never static. So this data is usually continuously produced um, it's also never clean, so there will always be errors in, in the data, and these errors can, they can be very subtle. It can simply be that um, you have to consume data from another system, and somehow the, 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 the system is changed by someone, they change the schema of the data, things like, uh, things like that, and um, it's very, very hard to, to, to um, avoid these, this, uh, these data errors ha to have an impact on um, on your application. Then usually we don't work with one data set. Usually the data that we consume uh, comes from many different sources. And um, in general, the data that we consume is also not under our control. Um, as I already mentioned before, very often model training is um, only one piece of large complex pipelines. Um, and um, it's not only that there are more steps, for training a model, it's also typically that systems have two parts. There's usually an offline part that trains the model, and then there's an online part where the model is served, where new data is collected, and they have lots of feedback loops. Um, so it's a complicated world. Um, another thing is that very often we have non-machine learning experts as end users or operators. So I think in many cases, the people who, who, who build systems uh, might be software engineers who have a, um, a background in data science, who took some online courses, but they are not, um, they are not academics who, who have a PhD in machine learning. So they need, uh, they need solutions that are more tailored towards uh, um, general engineers. Um, and also there's a, a second class of users, that's the people who operate um, who operate real world systems, often called DevOps engineers. And these, these people are probably also not machine learning experts. And we need to be able to build systems that allow them to, um, um, to easily operate these systems. And then when they get paged on the weekend because something is going wrong, they need to be able to, to uh, take action and, fi and uh, fix these problems. And very often in, in the real world, there's also a focus beyond predictive performance. Um, um, in research, we need something that we can measure so that we can uh, that we can compare our results. And often, that's just the the prediction performance for uh, for some given metric on held out data. Um, but in production, there are many orthogonal aspects that are uh, as important, like the scalability of our solutions, um, how simple it is, so that we can change and maintain it, um, the response times of our system, so that uh, provides a good user experience and also things like the debuggability like how difficult it is to uh, is it to um to inspect a, a solution if something is going wrong um and if you're interested in learning more about that um, um me and some colleagues from amazon we published a paper about some of these real world challenges that we that we see in the ieee data engineering bulletin uh, last year And um, I briefly want to give you two examples of research that we produced um, in this area of data management for, for machine learning that uh, addresses some of these issues. Um, so the first example is um, tailored towards what we call unit tests for data. And here the, the problem that we tackle is that uh, the quality of data and the validation of data is really a crucial problem. Um, in any data intensive uh, applications, in any use case where you make um, decisions based on data, but especially in, um, 
machine learning applications. And um, data quality is very important, and it can have it can have um, it, it can have a lot of impact. Um, so obviously, as soon as you make um, decisions based on data, then missing or incorrect data can result in wrong decision making. Um, people also often report that if you want to improve the performance of your model, then uh, cleaning the data is often a very easy way to improve this performance. And sometimes people observe much higher gains from cleaning the data than from running uh, extensive uh, model selection, for example. And the third aspect that's often overlooked is that data quality is also important for the operational stability. Um, it's not only that your systems can give you wrong results if you feed them with wrong data, it's also that systems can crash when you feed them with wrong data. Um, so, for example, if you have missing values in your data and you use um, um, use environment like the JVM, then um, and your code is not is not safe against these missing values, then you can produce null pointer exceptions because your code tries to access some data and there's nothing there, and that can lead to crashes of um, of your applications. And the um, one reason why data quality is becoming a bigger and bigger problem in the last years is that data also increasingly lives outside of relational database management systems. So relational databases um, give you a lot of tools to manage the quality of your data. So you have a schema for your data, you can define integrity constraints and things like that. But um, <clears throat> because we want to take a data-driven approach because it's become, it has become very cheap to store and process a lot of data, um, we've started to use different data stores. So we have now what's called data lakes. It's basically just folders on a distributed file system where we simply collect the data as it arrives. Um, data is often stored in key value stores where you don't really have a schema for the data. So you decide, okay, that's the key. And then there's some nested document that's part of that key. Uh, and also spreadsheets are still, spreadsheets and CSV files are, are also very, very widely used, which often have errors. Um, and as I said, so in these cases, there's no schema that can be enforced. There's often no integrity constraints that say, I don't know, this, this attribute must not be null, this attribute uh, must be unique and things like that. And then in complex organizations, data is also very often moved between different systems. Um, often maybe the main data store is very difficult and very slow to access. So what people usually do is they take some small sample from that data so that they can um, can work with the data on their local machine, but then if the data is updated in the main data store, this update is often not reflected in the copy and things like that. And in general, um, in real world use cases, data, data sets are often combined and integrated from many heterogeneous sources, and that's a natural, um, that's a natural source of errors. So we've observed that um, also when I worked in industry a lot. And um, one inspiration that we had in tackling this problem was that we looked at what, what, what people do in software engineering. So in software engineering, it's common to write so-called unit tests for your data. That's small pieces of code that basically test other code that invoke a method with inputs and outputs and then simply um, check whether this particular piece of code gives you the correct results. Um, and we found it odd that we have all this machinery to unit test software with continuous integration systems and, and things like that. But we don't have something like this for our data. And data is at least as important as code. So um, we, wrote a library, uh, we wrote, wrote a paper that we published at VLDB uh, two years ago where we um, um, pitched a system, proposed a system to, that provides you with unit tests for data. Um, that system is now open source. It's called uh, DQ. So it's a library for scalable data unit tests that's um, implemented in Apache Spark. If you, want to, if you want to check it out, it's available on GitHub. And it basically allows you to write something like a unit test for your data. Um, so you basically write down in a declarative way, this is how my data should look like. And then our library takes this test and um, translates it into a Spark job applies certain uh, query optimization techniques to make sure that the, the resulting parallel job that um, tests your data is, can be executed efficiently. Um, and then it scans your data and basically gives you back uh, the results that indicate um, 
which which of these checks that that you that you described for your test um, uh, held and which didn't. Um, we designed it in a way that it can scale to terabyte size data sets with billions of rows and hundreds of columns if you choose the statistics to check carefully. Um, and we also have support for for like for use cases where you have a new piece of data every day and don't want to run the job on the whole data set, for example. Um, this piece of work is um, um, it's widely it's widely used. So we know from users from the retail, retail uh, industry, from finance and health insurances, um, and it's also been integrated into Amazon's. Um, cloud solutions. So Amazon has a, a machine learning service called uh, AWS SageMaker. And as part of that, there's the SageMaker model monitor service that allows you to, um, to run concept drift detection on, on the data that you send to your machine learning models. And that's, uh, that is built on top of our DQ library. Um, the second piece of work that's currently under submission that I want that I want to uh, to showcase to you is about uh, detecting technical bias in machine learning pipelines. So that's something that's aimed at increasing fairness and accountability. And um, so this bias in machine learning uh, systems is a very very complex topic, and there's very different types of bias. There could be bias in how um, we collect the data. There could be bias simply in the world that uh, uh, is reflected in our data. But there's also this, um, what's often called technical bias, and that's basically errors in the data or um, um, that, uh, that are introduced by the way in which we process the data. And it's tricky that, um, uh, and the tricky thing is that, that we uh, often observe is that um, it's easy to accidentally introduce such bias in the data um, um, when you pre-process the data for, for your machine learning models. So um, often we work with pre-made data sets that we can just imp import from somewhere, but usually um, once we have data from the real world, there is some process to integrate it, to clean it, to fil filter it, to convert it to features. And it's very, very easy to, um, to introduce such bias. So one example is, let's say you work with demographic data for some reason, and you just filter it by zip code. Um, then in many countries, the zip code or the area where someone lives is correlated with attributes or with groups that might be considered uh, sensitive from a fairness perspective. So it could be that in, in certain areas, um, people of a certain age group live or people of a certain race. And that means that you create an imbalance in your data set just by filtering by an <clears throat> By a column that you maybe think is it's kind of innocent to do to do a, um, a filter by that attribute. Um, another case is if you have missing values in your data <clears throat> and you impute them, that can also that can also lead to imbalances um, that you accidentally introduce in your data. Maybe for some, let's say again, you work with demographic data, and maybe for some individuals the age is missing, and then um, you use some kind of imputation technique that then assigns um, maybe all people to a certain to a certain age group and again this introduces imbalances and the problem there is that um, at the moment data scientists have to be aware of these issues and have to be have to manually verify that no such problems occur in these in these data pipelines and it's very very difficult especially in cases where maybe one person a data engineer creates a pipeline to um, fetch and process the data, and then another person just consumes the data from this pipeline and trains a model on that. Then you can have these effects. Something changes in the pipeline, the other person is not aware of that, and you get these imbalances in the model. Um, so a solution that we developed for this is what's called ML Inspect. And the idea in ML Inspect is, again, inspired by software engineering. The idea is that um, we look at your code, your machine learning pipelines, um, in that case, we um, we focus on Python and on data science scripts that are written using uh, Pandas and Scikit-Learn and some kind of library to train your models. Um, and then we inspect this code and try to hint you at potentially problematic operations. So the inspiration here is code inspections in modern IDEs. 
So if you use a modern IDE like IntelliJ, for example, th this will often underline some piece of code and then give you some hint. Maybe you call um, a deprecated method or some some unsafe method that's not thread safe or, or things like that. And we think that we should have the same the same kind of tools for um, uh, for machine learning. So here we look at the operations that you apply to the data, maybe join operations, filter operations that you do in pandas or missing value imputation that's uh, run in a scikit-learn pipeline. Um, and from your code, we extract something like a query plan. That's this graph that you see here. And this qu uh, query plan has operators that change the data and we know some semantics of these operators. And that, that allowed us, allows us to automatically instrument your program at runtime. So then we can, for example, compute the proportions of certain, of certain groups after a join or after filter, and then do some statistical tests to see if the distribution changed because of that operation, and we can hint you there. Um, and we think that's, that's a way forward for a kind of a human in the, in the loop solution where um, we have automated ways to hint you at potential problems, and then the data scientist in charge looks at these problems and can decide um, how severe they are or not. Okay. So that concludes the, um, the, uh, the first part of, uh, of this talk, the general problems in bringing machine learning to production. And now in the second part, I would like to talk about um, specific challenges that I see for industrial scale online recommender systems. Um, and as I said in the beginning, um, um, I recently restarted some work on scalable recommender systems with our, one of our industry partners from our project here, uh, a large European e-commerce platform. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at a lot of, um, of interesting algorithms from research. And um, um, we want to see which of these can be, can be deployed in, uh, in large scale production setups. And at the moment, there's three big challenges that we see that we're working on, um, and that I would also, and I would like to give you my perspective on them as part of this talk. Um, so these three issues are, on the one hand, the scale of the data that you have to work with. It's kind of an evergreen issue. Um, then the response latency of these systems, how fast can they answer? And then um, a privacy-related challenge, which is to support the right to be forgotten. And um, let's start with scale. So um, I recently talked to our industry partner and I asked them from their perspective, what would be the minimal requirements for a scalable solution? Um, for something where they said, okay, that's how the solution needs to perform so that they would feel comfortable to, to put it in production. And that's really the, the minimum. Um, so they have a lot of data and they said um, a scalable recommender system for them <clears throat> needs to work with at least 10 billion interactions. That's like uh, where it starts. And also from a, uh, from a throughput perspective, the system needs to be able to answer um, 1,000 queries per second on average, and then there might be peak times where this system has to answer 10,000 queries of this, uh, uh, every second. Um, and also, um, so they have a, a huge catalog with a lot of items, but they said uh, that um, a deployable solution should at least be able to work with 2 million distinct items so that they can deploy it. And then they have um, um, other requirements, like um, they need to be able to retrain the model regularly, and uh, this retraining needs to adhere to so-called service level agreements, where basically one system guarantees to other systems that need data or models from the system that um, um, you can finish your computation in a, in a given time. time. So maybe you, do, you retrain every night and um, your model retraining is only allowed to take one hour and then other systems need to, need to get that model and deploy it uh, somehow, for example. And also there's always the problem of hyperparameter optimization. So that's something that can be done offline. That's also something that can be paralyzed fairly well. Um, but a deployable solution also needs to be manageable somehow. So that it, it needs to have um, um, a manageable effort and a manageable cost for finding hyperparameters. Um, and very often when I talk to people, then people might say, well, that's just engineering. So we can just sit down, have some competent engineers, and they can 
you give them a paper and they will build a, a, a scalable system from that. Um, and I think that unfortunately that's not the case um, simply because my observation is that it's really, really hard to build these systems and we have a lot of competent engineers and if it was just an engineering problem, then it would be much easier to build these systems. And um, I can give you some, um, some first-hand observations. So as part of, of a recent project that we ran with one of our industry partners, we took a very interesting study from Ludwig et al. that was um, published at Rexis, I think last year, where they compared different solutions for session-based recommendation. And they especially com compared relatively simple nearest neighbor-based approaches to um, more sophisticated neural-based approaches. Um, and in that paper, they found that um, performance-wise, or in terms of predictive performance, these simple baselines um, outperform the neural networks. Um, and we, we re uh, replicated these results in our data, but we also looked at the system-specific challenges. Um, and like one thing that we observed for one of the, of the, of the neural methods was that it exhibited really extremely lo long training times. Um, so we ran hyperparameters uh, optimization for one of the methods on a dedicated cloud machine with a GPU. And I think we only tested 100 combinations on 100,000 interactions. And we had, we had to run this for, for six days in total to, to evaluate these hyperparameters. Um, so that's, even, that's more than an engineering problem. That's really something where um, um, there's a research problem of adapting, of adapting this, me this method. And also in, in research that I've done earlier, where I evaluated different nearest neighbor methods from open source libraries, I also observed that many of them um, cannot process even medium-sized medium -sized data sets. And again, that's not, that's not to say there's something wrong with the algorithm. That's, that's just to say that um, designing an algorithm and uh, translating it into a scalable solution are two different research, two different important research problems. Um, and I think the reason for this is that um, when we design algorithms, we still implicitly design them for a computer because we are computer scientists. So in the end, everything somehow gets executed on, uh, on a machine. And unfortunately, the machines nowadays and the, and the systems are much more complicated than they used to be. So in the old days, we had one professor, uh, one, one processor, and then through Moore's law, this processor got faster and faster. And you, your mental model was basically, well, this one processor has access to the data, hope that the data fits into memory. Um, we can just randomly access. That's the way that many algorithms are, are designed. And that's also fine because um, that allows one to, to focus on, on the math and not on implementation detail. But unfortunately, Moore's law is ending now. And we have much more, much more complicated infrastructure. So nowadays, even every phone has um, <clears throat> has multiple cores, and um, all major companies basically use distributed systems to process process the data. So parallel and distributed execution is is the new normal, I would say. And that means that um, we cannot simply translate an abstract algorithm to code. It's not like just mapping every line of the algorithm to a line of code. It's we really like, I think what we have to solve is what I call the scalability puzzle. Um, so we have to look at distributed and parallel execution and what that requires. And often that means that we have, we have to execute the com com computations concurrently on some parts of the data. And also we have to partition the data. So we have to chop up the data and either put it on different machines or put it close to different cores. Um, and we also have to be aware of the fact that for, for different parts of the data, we have very different access times and that uh, can have a, a very huge impact on computations. It can make an, uh, a difference of an, or some orders of magnitude. And um, I think that's an ongoing research area that there have, have been many interesting solutions, but it's not really solved. Um, and basically the part of this puzzle is taking an abstractly defined algorithm, taking a parallel processing system or paradigm, like maybe MapReduce or Spark or parameter servers, and then figuring out how to 
take this algorithm and how to efficiently map it to this system so that it can be efficiently executed. Um, I've done some of that work in the good old days when people were still using MapReduce. Uh, so there's some op uh, old papers from us where we uh, showed how to um, how to do matrix factorization with ALS on MapReduce systems, for example. And there's a lot of work on, on, on efficient data processing with uh, parameter servers. Um, and I think a very interesting opportunity where I would like to see much more work here is to really design the algorithms with a certain paradigm in mind. Um, so at, um, at SIGMOD this year, um, um, we published uh, a, a paper from Amazon Research where we talked about Amazon SageMaker system, which is a, a, stream, a streaming machine learning system, um, which supports common algorithms, which is very, very scalable. And for that system, um, people really redesigned the algorithms. So they really thought, okay, we have this scalable system that's built on, on top of Apache MXNet, which is a, a, a deep learning engine with a parameter server built in. And then people really redesigned the algorithms to, um, to build them in a way that they can handle streaming data and that they can work with um, a, a, a fixed size state. And I think that really brings you to scalable solutions that are hard to, that are hard to get to otherwise. Um, so that was the first challenge. The second challenge that we ran into is a response latency. So when we talk about response la latency, we basically discuss the question that always arises in production setups is, um, how fast can my recommender system answer queries? And that's a question that's um, very important in production setup, but maybe not very important in, uh, in academic, academic lab conditions. Um, so if you if you think about e-commerce websites, then usually these websites consist of many different internal services that are that are called to, in order to build and render the website for the users. And recommender systems are one of these one of these services. And typically, they're hard SLAs, hard service service level agreements for the response latency of these systems. If they don't answer about uh, after a certain amount of milliseconds, they will just be cut off, and the website will be rendered without them. Um, and I think this response latency is a very interesting question, especially from a, from a systems perspective. Um, but unfortunately, it's also a question that is very, very hard to study in academic setups. In academic setups, um, we often focus either on prediction quality or on the scalability of algorithms, um, because that's something that is easier to measure in, 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 an, academic, uh, in an academic setup. We can just do offline evaluations on held out data to get a picture of the of the prediction quality and then we can run some scalability experiments on our cluster to see how how, an, how a solution reacts to growing data sizes for example but with response latency and especially with the impact of response latency in in a real world setup that's something that's very very hard to measure um, so we found some existing research for search engines where people basically ex um, artificially slowed down the responses of the search engine and then observed what impact it has, it has on the acceptance. And they found a negative impact. Um, um, but the catch with this research is that um, they can only slow down. Like they, they can only make this response latency worse because they cannot artificially increase the response latency of the system. That's very, very difficult. But um, one of our in, in, uh, industry partners ran an, a very interesting experiment that I would that I would like to share with you. Um, and they kind of ran this in a in a, a unique opportunity because they were conducting um, a migration from a propri proprietary data center that they had to the Google Cloud. And as part of this migration, they decided to optimize the response latency of many of the systems, including the serving system of their recommender system. Um, so they rewrote some services. They updated a lot of uh, a, a, lo a lot of libraries. Um, they took special care that the systems can auto scale themselves when uh, when there's back pressure. Um, they even control the insertion rate at, when they do bulk updates into their their, their serving system for the recommendations. Um, so they they invested a lot of work to not artificially slow down one solution, but to make one 
um, deployed system really respond much, much faster. And the interesting thing is that they also conducted an A-B test during that migration for several weeks on more than 19 million user sessions. And so this A-B test basically serves the same recommendations. So it's the same system, um, but deployed in two different setups in the proprietary, proprietary data center and the Google Cloud. So you get the same, you basically have the same algorithm deployed, but one of them can respond much, much faster. So they measured the, the uh, P90 of the response latency of their system, basically between the front end that renders the websites and the, uh, the web pages and the serving system. And um, they increased this P90 response latency from 32 milliseconds to 15, to 15 milliseconds. And interest, interestingly, they observed uh, more than a 2% increase in, in business relevant metrics based on orders and revenue for the faster version. So they didn't really change the algorithm. It was the same algorithm. The algorithm was just responding faster and that gave them really um, a huge lift up in, in the metrics that they care about. And I think that's a really interesting experiment. Um, and I think for us as academics, it's, all, it's, it's also important to think about the implications of this. Um, so for example, um, as far as I know with neural networks, you often have the problem that they respond very slow and then there's different, different uh, techniques that you can apply to increase the, 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 the um, response latency of your model. So you can prune your model, simply remove some, uh, some part of the, of the computation, or you can reduce the, the precision of the, um, of, the, of the computations in your model. And typically we, we assume, because we do offline, offline tests as well, that has some kind of negative impact on the accuracy of, uh, of that model, on the predictive performance. And an interesting question that um, um, what could be worthwhile to explore is um, the trade-off there. So you have some accuracy loss, in offline tests, but maybe you have an accuracy gain or a gain in the metrics that you care about um, in the in the real world because of the um, of the increase in in in, in the uh, in the latency. So that's something I wanted to to share with you. Um, and the last challenge that I want to talk about is um, concerned with the so-called right to be forgotten. So recently there has been um, um, uh, different laws, especially the GDPR in Europe, um, that gives users a lot of control over their data and that enforces what's often called privacy through deletion. So it basically gives users the right to request the timely deletion of their data from systems that store and process the data. And um, there's a lot of discussion about this, um, but a lot of people, including me, argue that um, that doesn't only apply to primary data stores like databases, but also to machine learning models that are derived from the data. And um, there are some cases, and we have an, uh, an, an, an illustration of <clears throat> one case that we, that we, we talked about, uh, one constructed case that we talked about in a recent paper where um, if you have the database without the deleted records and a stale machine learning model that has been trained on the data, you can do elaborated guesses about deleted data or even restore it in some cases. So if you think of recommendation models, for example, you could have a similarity matrix between users or some kind of embedding that allows you to, to retrieve similar users for one user who has their data deleted. And then maybe you can reconstruct this data with some certainty from, um, from these similar users because you know they are, they, um, they are close in the embedding space, so the original data must also be very similar to, to the data of that user. And from a systems perspective, from a deployment perspective, the question is also, okay, how, we, how do we now build this right to be forgotten and privacy through deletion? How do we build this into the, the uh, machine learning applications and the recommended systems that we have? Um, and at the moment, I think what's what's typically happening is that there are there's some complex bookkeeping going on. So a user requests the deletion of their data and then that gets stored somewhere. And then um, once you retrain retrain machine learning models, for example, you have to 
make sure that you don't use the data of, of, of these users and then you need to, to uh, redeploy the model and whatnot. So that's something that's very, very complicated. And um, as far as I know, in, 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 in real world setups at the moment, there's still very, very long waiting times until you guaranteed that your data is deleted from the system. So if I recently looked into the documentation of the Google Cloud, um, which claims to be GDPR compliant. And there, um, I think it can take, they say it can take up to 30 days until data is deleted from active systems and up to 180 days until it's also deleted from backup systems. Um, so I think the question is, can, can we do better? Can we give, if people have this right, um, can we give them like the technical opportunity to instantly execute this right, to instantly have their, have their data deleted, for example. And uh, a big problem there is that, in, in, my opinion, uh, in my view, a lot of the existing systems and algorithms that we have are simply not designed with data deletion in mind. Um, so in, in, in the last years, it has become increasingly, uh, in, incredibly cheap to store data. And if we look at this design, for example, of many distributed file systems, then the fine-grained deletion is not really is, is 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 not really part of their design. Uh, usually, they 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 are designed to um, um, to support very fast append-only writes, um, and that's really baked into the core design of these systems. So, I think an interesting research challenge in that area is to think about how we can make deletes and deletion operations really first-class citizens of algorithms and systems. Um, and um, <clears throat> our group published some uh, preliminary work on that earlier this year at the CIDA conference in the data management space. It's a conference that's uh, usually looking for um, um, risky innovative work. Um, and we discussed a few approaches to um, efficiently delete data in place from trained machine learning models. We are what's often called the decremental learning. So basically the opposite of incremental learning. You don't add data to your model, you try to remove data uh, from, uh, from the model. And from a, from a deployment perspective, it would be awesome if we can do this without having to re-access the training data of the model. Um, because usually in these, in these production setups, the, the training data, especially if it's, uh, if it's sensitive personal data, is stored in highly secured networks, very far, very far away and secu secured from the system that actually has the models deployed. So it would be great if we could find a way to just update the model in, in place where it is and not have to re-execute complicated uh, deployment pipelines. Um, <clears throat> so we had some ideas, we, we presented some ideas on how to do that at deployment time with millisecond latency. Um, but a limitation in this paper uh, that I want to be honest about is also that um, it's only straightforward for very, very simple machine learning models like item-based collaborative filtering, for example. But I think that's an interesting, um, that's also a very interesting direction for the future. Um, and especially this angle of not requiring re, uh, re, retraining or re-access to the training data. That's difficult, but that would, that would make this um, much, much easier to deploy. And um, I'm coming to the end of my talk now and um, I want to try to get all these strings that I, all these things that I talked about to get them together and to give you an, um, an idea of basically the research that is going on now, now in, uh, in our group and some of these systems, systems that we explore in order to uh, tackle all these challenges. So I think one very, very interesting direction to explore is so-called differential computation. Um, and that's pioneered by a system called the differential data flow that uh, Frank McSherry presented a few years ago, also at CIDA. It's built on an uh, abstraction called timely data flow. And basically the system is a data flow system similar to Apache Spark or Apache Flink. Um, but it's the interesting, uh, the interesting distinction is that um, existing data flow systems operate on collections. So in Spark you, um, read collections or data frames as input, you do your computations and Spark produces new collections as output. And differential data flow doesn't directly operate on collections, it operates on differences of collections. 
So the input to your system are differences in the input and the output of your system are also the differences of the outputs. Um, and um, differential data flow is built on this new computational model called differential computation, which is similar to traditional incremental computation, but also allows uh, nested iterations, which uh, is very important for many uh, machine learning or graph workloads. And the nice thing about that system is that it's also, there's a very efficient implementation built in Rust and it provides um, a declarative data, uh, data parallel data flow language. So you basically program it in a way that's similar to um, how you would work with um, um, collections in functional, in, in, in functional languages or with systems like Spark or Flink where, um, um, where you have these data flow operations that, that you can chain together, like joins, filters, maps, reduces, and things like that. Um, and also differential data flow is, uh, is, is publicly available, it's open source. Um, so at the moment we're looking on, uh, on differential data flow and <clears throat> playing with different implementations of recommendation algorithms on top of it. And we think that it's, it's very well suited to, uh, to tackling these problems that I, uh, that I outlined. Um, so for the problem of scale, I think that is covered because data parallel execution with a data flow model that can be efficiently parallelized across, um, across different, different cores and also across different computers is, in my view, um, a proven paradigm. So Spark and Flink have, uh, are built on top of this paradigm and both of them um, have been very successful and are widely used in, in many, many real world deployments. Um, I think differential data flow is also <clears throat> uh, very much geared to um, providing low latency responses because in, in, in general, if you have a computational model and a system that's really built for just computing the differences of outputs, that's something that natural, has a natural synergy with low response latencies because you really try to avoid to, re, uh, to, re to redo computations as much as possible. Um, and in my view, the most interesting thing and also the most distinguishing fact is that um, <clears throat> differential data flow has delete operations built in as a first class citizen. So if you read the papers or the documentation of the system about the computational model, then really deleting data, basically one difference, so a difference is either you add something to an input collection or you remove something from an in input collection. So it's really something that's built into the, 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 the abstract foundational model on which, on which the, 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 the system is implemented. Um, so, and, and I think that, <clears throat> so that allowed, that for example, immediately gives you things like, like joints or, or even more complicated data flows that allow you to remove data and that will recompute what changes once you, once you remove this data. So I think um, <clears throat> that's something very nice to play around with and that doesn't uh, require us to do the, the uh, foundational work. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, um, we have, um, an example implementation of um, a simple but classic uh, uh, item-based collaborative filtering in, in that we contributed to differential data flow. And at the moment, we're basically investigating implementations of um, more recent algorithms on top, on top of the system. Um, and with that, I'm closing the talk. I hope that I could give you some interesting insights or new, or, or new directions or um, problems to work on. Um, in summary, I tried to convince you that bridging the gap between machine learning research and machine learning production is a hard problem and it's also a hard research problem. Um, the route that I think needs to be taken is to adapt and reinvent many of the existing techniques from data management and software engineering. And there are the three challenges that I see for industrial scale recommender systems, scale, response latency, and supporting efficient data forgetting. And I think that differential uh, computation is one of the um, interesting directions that we should look into. And with that, I close the keynote and I'm uh, happy to answer questions if you have some. Thank you very much.